On the first day, God created light and separated darkness from it, day from night. On the second day, God created the sky. On the third day, God gathered all the waters into a single basin and called it the sea. And the dry land that appeared, God called the earth. And on the earth, God brought forth every kind of vegetation. On the fourth day, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars to govern day and night, to mark the days, the seasons, and the years. On the fifth day, God created the winged birds that filled the sky and all the living creatures in the sea. On the sixth day, God brought forth on the earth every kind of animal, tame and wild. And then God said, Let us make the human being in our image, male and female, and let's give them dominion over all that's been created. God said it was all good, very good. On the seventh day, God rested and handed over the keys to the garden. And the human beings took their cue from the Creator and started creating too, and innovating and discovering, designing and inventing, and producing and inventing some more and fashioning and crafting, constructing and building, and innovating some more, and advancing and modernizing, manipulating and interfacing, and programming and producing some more. And it was good. And we built and built. We built dwellings to keep us safe from animals, from the winds and storms, the cold and the heat. We built huts and houses, apartments and mansions, castles and palaces. We built places to worship God, acknowledge the divine, experience transcendence, meeting houses, churches, cathedrals, synagogues, temples, mosques, shrines. Some built skyscrapers and monuments to others. Some built them to themselves. We built villages, towns, cities, and nations. We built gated communities and border walls. We built stadiums to cheer, hospitals to heal, offices to work, factories to produce, schools to learn, stores to shop, courthouse to decide, state houses to govern. We discovered the cure for diseases, invented better ways of farming, ways of traveling faster and farther. We designed quicker and more widespread ways of communicating. It was good. Well, some of it was good. Some of it, not so good. We learned how to forge nature into power. Power into profit. Profit into motive. Motive into greed. Greed into excuses. Excuses to create more stuff, to fabricate the demand for more, to convince others they need things they don't. A bigger house, faster car, more jewelry, inexpensive clothes, expensive clothes, new clothes, latest electronics, the newest gadgets, the smarter television, the smarter phone. Stuff for convenience, stuff for status, stuff to make us feel better to make us feel important, stuff to collect, to hoard. We invented weapons and built armies to protect our stuff. Weapons to protect the production of our stuff. Weapons to take stuff from others. We need new, always new. We throw out the old. We create waste, plastic waste, electronic waste, textile waste, metal waste, biomedical waste, and just plain old garbage. We throw out people along the way. People who get in the way of our land, grab our fuel, grab our resources. People we think are a threat to our profit. 
We exploit the others who we think will increase our profit. We turn a blind eye to those who hurt our pursuit of profit. Things to have, without a thought for the have-nots, without a thought for the earth. We forgot we are of nature, not above it. We forgot we are part of the ecosystem, not separated from it, and that we cannot thrive or survive outside it. We put ourselves in the center as if all nature is there for our disposal. As if nature is not good in and of itself. As if nature derives its value only from us and our needs and wants. As if the cheetah needs us to say it's fast. Or the dolphin needs us to say it jumps and dives with grace. As if the eagle needs us to note that it soars or that the flower smells so sweet. As if the river needs us to say it flows. The Amazon doesn't need us to tell it that its moisture feeds the Sierra Nevada mountains and the supplies water to the fertile valleys in California. Nature does nature without our help. But we can get in the way. And we have. So, here we are. Yet, nature doesn't relent. It sends warnings. It fights back. The storm of the century happens every year. We have three relationships that give our lives their deepest meaning. With God. With others. With the earth. When we pursue the goods of the earth without regard for the people we hurt and the harm we inflict on the earth itself, we have turned our back on the God who has created it all and who has gifted us with life, love, and communion with God, with each other and with the earth. What are the signposts of these three broken relationships? We forget that we are derived from nature. We believe we are above it or beyond it. We think we own the earth. We believe that others are mere instruments in our drive for profit. We think our right to profit is greater than the demands of the common good. We think natural resources are unlimited, and the more we have, the more power we have. We try to gain control over all objects that serve our immediate needs. We fail to recognize that human flourishing goes hand in hand with the flourishing of the natural world. We fail to feel our connection to the earth, our common home, and to each other, and thus to God. But along the way, there have been those who do not forget these three relationships. There were and are those with a different vision. Ignatius of Loyola, on the banks of the river Cardinal, Watching and listening as the river water rushed by came to the profound insight that God is in all things. He wrote, The eyes of his understanding began to be opened. He understood the world had been reconciled to God. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God irrevocably united heaven and earth, the divine and the human. Human experience and human history were transformed and creation was renewed. The human person was reconciled to God, to neighbor and to the earth. Creation was not something to be exploited for personal or corporate gain. Creation is the handiwork of God. Thus, Ignatius believed that everything in the world has the potential to bring us closer to the end for which we were created, communion with God. Because God is present and actively sustaining creation, Ignatius believed our search for God must begin in the world. For Ignatius, belief that God is in all things is manifested in a life lived with generosity and openness. When I believe that God is in all things, I can't retreat into separatism and exclusivity. I cannot draw boundaries around class, gender, race, religion, culture. Instead, I am drawn into solidarity with others. I am drawn into their lives and times, their joys and struggles. I am compelled to help souls, 
I may encounter God in the face of the least expected person, and I may be asked to provide the greatest service. How do I provide the greatest service? Ignatius writes, I should ponder with affection all that God has done for me, and that should not bury in the earth all the gifts and graces God continually imparts. There have been those inspired by Ignatius over the centuries who have brought and who still bring their gifts to bear in the service they provide through their curiosity and their pursuit of science. Jesuits who, as botanists, geologists, paleontologists, biologists, naturalists, astrophysicists, astronomers, semiologists, climate scientists, and meteorologists follow the mysteries of creation to God. There are those who brought and who bring still their gifts to bear in the service of the poor by accompanying the marginalized as pastors, priests, teachers, community organizers, sociologists, lawyers, doctors, psychologists, politicians, advocates, philosophers, craftsmen, and artists. Some have given their all. There are those who recognize the deep fissure in our relationship with God with others and with the earth. Those who now see the interconnection between the poor and environmental degradation and corporate greed and the abuse of political power. Those who seek to heal our relationship with God, with others and with the earth by speaking truth to power, by standing alongside the displaced and discarded, by advocating tirelessly for their right to the land and water needed for sustenance and flourishing. Stanislas Lourdeswamy, or Father Stan Swamy, was one such man. He took Ignatius, urging to do one thing necessary to heart for Father Swamy, an Indian Jesuit. The one thing necessary was to get at the root of oppression of the Jharkhand's tribal Adivasi people. Father Swamy, for over half a century, advocated for the Adivasi people and other marginalized groups, including the Dalits the lowest in Hinduism caste hierarchy by standing up to big mining companies and the public officials behind them. He set up a center dedicated to social activism, particularly the protection of Adivasi's legal rights to land and water. It was said of him that he was a champion of the poor and the voiceless, who believed the reign of God was present in the world today and found most profoundly in the simple acts of unconditional steadfast love performed in those communities most despised. His embrace of God, his love of others, and his respect for the earth, his fight for the rights of indigenous people to protect their rich customs and traditions and to have access to their land and water as means of sustenance brought him into conflict with the political power. A confrontation he would not survive. Let us remember Father Stan Swamy with gratitude and all those who labor still to heal our relationship with God, with others, and with the earth. Those who look for alternative lifestyles that respect creation. Those who find ways to produce goods that sustain and not deplete the earth. Those who strive to distribute just the goods produced so all humans may flourish as God intended. Let us pray. Lord, you create all things and you sustain in every moment all things created. Deepen our faith that all of creation has the potential to bring us closer to you. Because Christ resides in its center as the Alpha and Omega, irrevocably reconciling us to you. Lord, you created us daily with the love that resides in the depth of our being and in the heart of your creation. My very being is contingent upon that love, draws life from that love, and is drawn into that love. Increase our acceptance of our own creaturehood 
and help us ponder with deep affection all that you have done for us and how much you have given us. Give us a keen appreciation of the created world, the curiosity to explore it, the eyes to see it truly, the heart to embrace it fully, the mind to understand it better, and the will to protect and preserve it always. Deepen our gratitude for the vast expanse of the universe, the smallest particle of matter, the constancy of nature, the intricate complexity of living beings, and the consciousness of the human person. Broaden our understanding of our dependency on the substance and sustenance of the terrestrial, freshwater, and marine ecosystems of which we are a part. Heal our deliberate and ignorant estrangement from a natural world that has caused its degradation. Lord, help us to see us ourselves as sojourners in the world, not owners of it. Strengthen our resolve to appreciate and engage our global solidarity, that splendid universal communion, as we strive to care for our common home. For this we pray.